morning. Good morning again. Welcome to this post-election panel of political writers to analyze the primary elections here in Seattle. Today's post-election panel is, of course, hosted by the Seattle Neighborhood Coalition, all of you. And thank you for introducing yourselves to us. Uh, my name is Alex Peterson. I'm filling in this morning at the request of one of your fearless leaders, Bill Bradbert. I served as legislative aide to City Council Member Tim Burgess, uh, where I worked on the Seattle Preschool Program and other issues. My background is primarily in affordable housing, getting my start at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development during the Clinton administration. I'd like to say during the first Clinton administration. Um, for the past three years, I've published a neighborhood newsletter called Four to Explore. Focus is on Northeast Seattle, where my family and I live. We're very fortunate to have at this table some of the most knowledgeable and perceptive political commentators here in Seattle. They all work very hard to cover the political news. They're all excellent writers. We very much appreciate their generosity in not only attending today's panel, but also sharing their insights with us about Seattle's current elections. Here's a quick overview of the agenda. I will quickly introduce the panelists, then we'll jump into the panel discussion. I'll ask the first several questions. After each question, our panelists will each take a turn to answer, if they wish, and we'll try to keep their answers to about two minutes, just to keep us on the schedule. We have some cushion in the agenda for some back and forth among the panelists. And then answering all of my questions will take up about the first hour or so, and then we'll open it up to qu uh, questions from the audience. And we, as you know, we need to finish around 11.30. Let me introduce the panelists. Um, at my far left is Erica C. Barnett. She's an expert observer of politics, especially in City Hall where I used to work. Uh, she's been a writer and editor, as she likes to say, since the time of electric typewriters. And she worked for Publicola, The Stranger, and Seattle Weekly. Now, personal, during my lunch breaks at City Hall, I would immediately surf the Publicola website and read her articles to find out what my colleagues at City Hall were actually doing. And um, her investigative reporting was really important to add context to what was what was really going on in the Seattle Times is not covering. And for the past few years, Eric has had her own very popular political blog called The C is for Crank, with over 12,000 followers on Twitter. You can read more of Erica's articles and commentary on the C is for Crank.com. Then uh, Venice Buhayan of The Globalist. Venice is the news editor at The Seattle Globalist. Venice has covered education and politics. She's also the president of the Seattle chapter of the Asian American Journalists Association. Venice has covered the mayoral election closely. She's published a very informative piece of, in which the mayoral candidates each answer six policy questions at length. You should check it out at the Globalist, seattleglobalist.com especially the responses of Durkin and Moon. Job Parrish, uh, over 20 years ago, Job launched a publication called Eat the State, and he's written for The Stranger, Seattle Weekly, Mother Jones, and other publications. Job currently has a weekly segment as part of the Mind Over Matters public affairs show on KDXP, where he spoke from just moments ago in a heroic uh, arrival here. And uh, he publishes a monthly column also for City Living Newspaper. Job recently published an analysis entitled, Can Moon Beat Durkin? Which you can read at job.org. And I'm sure we'll find out what he thinks the answer is to that. So uh, let me set the table here for our discussion. Uh, you know, from the middle of July through the evening of August 1st, voters mailed in their ballots. The mayor of Seattle, both the at-large, the two at-large city council seats, port commissioner, King County executive, and in many neighborhoods, Seattle school board. In addition, there was Prop 1 to increase the local sales tax for the benefit of art, science, and cultural programs. Today's panel will probably focus on mayor and Seattle city council. Uh, 187,000 people cast their vote for Seattle mayor in the primary. That's 40% of the registered voters. 
versus only 35% turnout during the previous mayoral primary in August 2013. Over 55,000 more people are likely to turn out in November. So here's the first question. Analysts, what surprised you? Focusing on the positions of mayor and city council, which election results did you not expect? Let me start with Eric. Oh, okay. Um, well, I, um, thanks for having me here. Um, I um, would say, uh, this isn't exactly a surprise because I'm always wrong on my predictions, um, consistently. But, uh, but I, was, I, I was surprised um, that Carrie Moon got through. Um, because I didn't think that the uh, bump from the stranger's endorsement was as significant as it, I think it turned out to be. Um, stranger endorsed her. They also sort of hedged their bets by um, sort of co-endorsing Nikita Oliver after the fact, but I think that didn't really matter because people pull the cheat sheet out of the paper, do whatever they do, um, and that's a Karen Moon. And I think, you know, she's an, a relatively political unknown. I mean, I, I wrote about her back in 2005, um, when she was trying to um, to stop the tunnel, but she's kind of been you know not nowhere since. Then. I mean, she's been working, but not in city politics. So I was really surprised. I thought Keith Oliver was going to make it through, um, just on the basis of you know of everyone I talked to. I mean, people who I would not think would vote for Nikita Oliver <coughs> based on their politics um, were were voting for her. You know, sort of on principle, not on policy necessarily. So you know, it just goes to show. I, my predictions are always wrong, and I live in a bubble, but I thought Nikita was going to make it through. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, so, actually, what what surprised me was that Bob Hasegawa didn't do better than he did. I was, um, you know, because of you, you look at the slate of candidates, the top candidates, he was kind of one of the more experienced in terms of, like, knowing how to... Uh, uh, or being a, being a politician and campaigning, and also probably like the biggest known quantity, but maybe that was also kind of what influenced people. Maybe they were looking for something new. So, um, but I was, I was actually really surprised that he um, uh, didn't seem to do, uh, didn't didn't seem to campaign better than he than he actually did. And so, and I was also kind of surprised about like you know the results just given um, kind of the. Uh, you know, just kind of given the person on the street, you know, uh, I guess settled up about like who they were voting for and expected they can all over again. You know, you didn't care a lot of people like, you know, uh, going out for Carrie Moon, but you know, that that was just, I, but then again, you know, that's just like the people that I know and, uh, the, you know, and uh, I guess the demographic on Facebook or whatever it is, you know, that's that, that could be part of contributing to the bubble. So, yeah, so those are the two things that, that really surprised me. Um, thanks also for having me, and I'm sorry it was a little bit late. Uh, sorry, I was talking about traffic in Seattle. Um, I was surprised that I was right. Uh, I had the top six in order, and uh, the reason I didn't think Oliver would get through, even though she had by far the most buzz and the most passionate supporters, is primary elections tend to skew older and more conservative. Those are the people who vote regularly in, in off year primaries. Uh, and it skews north of the ship now. Uh, in fact, uh, large, uh, I think it's 35 to 40 percent, is north of 85th. And I didn't think all of it would be strong in those areas, and it turned out she wasn't. She was, her base was from your valley and, and in this precincts. Uh, so she did well, and obviously she came very close, but I didn't think that would be enough to put her over the top. Um, I thought Bob Hasegawa's campaign was just uh, crippled by the record long legislative session because he could not raise money legally until the legislature was uh, formally declared over, which even in a contested budget year like this year, uh, folks would expect that to happen by June 30th. It didn't happen until mid-July of college they mailed out. So he couldn't raise any money, couldn't do any paid for voter contact. Um, and, you know, if, if you're under 50 in this city, you don't remember the days when Austin Powell was a, was a young labor firebrand and activist who made a name for himself. And the, the split between him and all of them was very much generational. Um, I think she would have done better if he wasn't in the race. And if he had even a couple of weeks to fundraise, I don't think she comes as close. Um, the thing that surprised me in terms of the election, I thought Sarah Nelson had a lot of momentum from her last minute uh, 
advertising blitz. She was a business support candidate for uh, city council in the race with John Brand and uh, Teresa Mosqueda. She almost beat Brand, but not quite. I thought she would get through, and she did. Um, which, personally, I'm kind of glad about, but I was surprised that that happened. Excellent, thank you. Um, speaking of, of money in campaigns, a uh, new thing this time, democracy vouchers. And then also there was a concern that the independent expenditures would, would increase. There was some self-financing that, that occurred as, as well. So let's talk about democracy vouchers, independent expenditures, and the sources of, of money for these campaigns. Which do you think had the most influence during the primary? And what do you think will have the most impact during the general election? Um, the, um, and, and just got online this morning, the democracy vouchers, apparently there was about 395,000 spent on democracy vouchers. And for the independent expenditures, it was about the same amount of money, which was interesting. Um, well, so democracy vouchers, as you guys probably all know, are only for city council candidates and, um, and city attorney. And city attorney, right? So we'll see that in November. Um, but um, you know, I think they did have uh, they did have a significant impact in the position eight race. Um, the uh, independent expenditures in that race were not huge, although Teresa Skate did get some help from labor. Um, but I think you know, I think John Grant raised a tremendous amount of money on democracy vouchers alone, which I do think helped him um, in, in that race. I think in the mayor's race, I mean, the IEs, uh, well, actually, sorry, going back to position eight, Sarah Nelson, on the other hand, had um, a lot of money in independent expenditures. I mean, just, I was just looking at it, it's like $175,000 or something like that, and she didn't make it through. So the Chamber of Commerce kind of wasted its money on her. Um, uh, in the mayor's race, I mean, Jenny Durkin has raised so much money on her, of her own. I, mean, I think it's like over half a million dollars now just for the primary. Um, she's getting some IEs, but I think, you know, she's going to get so much money that it might be that she doesn't really even need the independent expenditures because she's going to be, you know, a million dollar, a million and a half dollar candidate. Yeah, we're, we're really in unknown territory in terms of the amount of money that Durkin is going to be able to raise in November for the mayor's race. Mounts has already raised. And whether spending that money is even cost effective. I mean, there's only so many direct mail pieces you can send out to every household before it becomes a waste of money. There's only so many Facebook and cable ads that you can run uh, before, yeah, okay, we know she's running for the channel. Uh, so it's. I, I don't know how much of an impact it will have. I think the democracy vouchers had been available for the mayor's race uh, to keep all over the election this year. So the fact that it was not in the mayor's race uh, made a determinative difference there. Um, other than that, um, you saw Grant um, fairly narrowly win in the position, or actually finished second in the position eight race. I don't think that happens without the democracy vouchers. So it was a determinative there as well. And one quick thing. Um, I, I do think, you know, one cautionary thing in the mayor's race is that Carrie Moon can spend her own money, and that's what she did in the primary. So she spent almost $100,000 or $90,000 of her own money. Um, she's very wealthy, so she has a lot of money to spend. And she said she'll, she's well resourced, Moxie Media is her consultant, and they said we'll spend what we have to spend. So that, I mean, don't count that out, even if Jimmy Durkin raises a million dollars. Carrie Moon might spend, you know, a few hundred thousand of her own cash. Yeah. But Moon, Moon does not need to match Durkin for uh, dollar for dollar. She just raised, needs to raise enough money to get her own message out competitively. And uh, both uh, Durkin's family has quite a bit of money also. So resources are not going to be a problem between the two. Okay, question three. When we touched a little bit on this, but campaign strategies, which campaign strategies were most effective at getting through the primary election? What mistakes did the losing campaigns make? And what strategies will the surviving candidates need to win on November 7th? In terms of the losing strategies, I think the most spectacular failure among the candidates for mayor was Michael Gensfair getting traction at all, even though he entered the race with far more name recognition than any of the other candidates. 
um, which can be a mixed blessing. Um, he had alienated a lot of the environmentalists that were, were in big, his basement in 2009, and I think attempted to appeal to neighborhood uh, activists and groups, even though uh, he was fairly hostile to them during his time as mayor. And I think people remember that, he didn't get a lot of traction with it, and he ended up being very poorly, and uh, there's a cautionary tale there somewhere. Um, I think um, John Grant had a strategy that was effective, but um, you know I thought it's somewhat distasteful of taking a lot of credit for things that he was peripherally associated with, like the minimum wage campaign, where he worked as an organizer. Um, but you know he sort of I think you know you have Teresa Mosqueda um, who came in first, who I mean has just been this consistent you know I mean powerful voice as a lobbyist for labor in Olympia. Um, she you know was really involved in getting paid family leave passed um, and helped draft the minimum wage legislation. But, you know, I would say John Grant um, struck me as kind of the typical guy coming in and taking credit for, you know, a woman's hard behind the scenes work. Um, and that's that's my personal opinion, but it's based on, you know, on knowing Teresa and having worked with her a little bit when I was at Mayor Alfred Place, Washington. Um, you know, but I think that was very effective. I think he got out there and he said, I did this and this is me alone and got a lot of credit and got a lot of traction from, um, from taking credit for things that, you know, were not his accomplishments alone. So, um, even though, uh, you know, Oliver is not going to make it through, I thought that, I thought that it was actually a really effective campaign and getting a lot of people excited about her and not, um, you know, just kind of going from um, a person that people kind of know in, in a certain niche of, of Seattle and then, you know, kind of getting her name out there kind of throughout, throughout the city. And I thought it was, uh, you know, people getting excited about issues that, um, you know, the other candidates aren't, aren't talking about, you know, such as like, you know, race and class and that sort of thing as well. So I thought that that was, um, you know, it's really uh, effective in getting those conversations into the you know, into the mix and kind of into the air. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that it continues to be general, even though she won't be there, but that's, uh, so even though she lost, I thought that was really effective. Yeah, I was going to go somewhere similar with that. Uh, people forget that before Shama Salon four years ago, it had been a long time since we saw any citywide campaign in Seattle that was really propelled by grassroots enthusiasm. And uh, Sawant won in that model in 2013 and then was reelected uh, two years ago in her district. And we saw both John Grant and uh, Nikita Oliver uh, utilize a lot of volunteers, uh, get a lot of people excited, uh, use those volunteers, do a lot of voter contact. And it's really um, sort of part of the toolbox of potential uh, campaign strategies now that we really hadn't seen until fairly recently. So, um, uh, and I, I, I agree with uh, Venice that uh, Nikita's campaign was very effective. Uh, even though she didn't make it through, uh, she really set the standard for the number of volunteers that she raised, the amount of passion that they brought to the campaign, and uh, really taking somebody who could have been seen as a, a fairly niche candidate with a narrow range of interests and a narrow base, and um, and making her a factor citywide. So it was it was a very effective campaign. To add some context to that, I have a Nikita Oliver sign still in my front yard. <laughs> um, so, speaking of Nikita um, and other defeated candidates, what will their impact be on the general election? Um, keeping in mind that that the general election will bring out very, you know, fifty-five thousand or so new voters. Erica, can we start with sure. you? Um, I think if, um, if Nikita's uh, voters end up going for Carrie, that will be really significant. Um, I think that she, um, you know, sort of has, uh, I mean, it's kind of in her hands a little bit at this point because, um, you know, I don't think that all those voters are necessarily Carrie Moon voters. Nikita and Carrie have very different policy positions on a lot of things and, you know, and, and some voters vote on policy, some voters vote on personality, and some voters vote on name recognition and other things. But. Um, but I think if she ends up, you know, allying with Carrie Moon, I know um, Carrie has definitely indicated that she would like that. Um, you know, she's done sort of outreach to, to Nikita's voters. You know, when, when they were counting votes, she said, I want to help you count votes. Um, and, um, and, and I think that's, you know, somewhat sincere and somewhat opportunistic because, um, 
she needs those voters, and if they don't turn out again in the um, in the general election, um, she's going to have a really tough time. She already has a very tough time against I mean, an extremely well funded and um, in a way in the lead candidate Jimmy Durkin. So I think that's that could be a huge factor. Keeping in mind again, sorry that my predictions are always <laughs> don't listen to me. Yeah, I think that the the big question will be like how many um, you know how many people came out. For Nikita, like for her um, positions, and how many were, were sort of inspired by her personally? I mean, I, I think you know it's a mistake to kind of assume that it was just kind of like a you know it was a force of personality that got people. Out. I think that she you know kind of really spoke to people who were kind of um, you know who are regular voters and who you know uh, who, who you know kind of wanted to see her positions get you know, some of her positions represented. And so I think um, you know. I think that that is kind of the big question, you know, whether, um, you know, any, uh, either, uh, well, you know, whether Carrie Moon can get uh, candidates excited for her, uh, get, get her, uh, get the kids all, get the kid of Oliver's voters excited for her as well and to come out for her uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the general. And I think that's kind of the, uh, you know, you know, yeah, like, like you said, a lot of that is in uh, Nikita Oliver's hands, and a lot of that will be, yeah, how successful Harry Moon is in convincing them that you know, she's sincere and that she, you know, yeah, she's just not trolling for votes or whatever, you know. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I agree with all that. Um, I, I think it was very, maybe very smart to drive and trying to get outreach to all of her voters, and I don't know whether she can uh, make that big success point or not. Um, I've heard from a lot of all of our voters that, oh, it's two wealthy white women running and so there's nothing there for us. Um, the, it, I don't think Durkin is as clear-cut a favorite as the sort of conventional wisdom seems to make it. If you look at the top six candidates who ran uh, recently well-funded campaigns, um, really it kind of divides somewhat deeply the, the, the um, the wild card being that nobody really knows who voted for Mike McGinn or why, uh, other than not many people did. But uh, the other five candidates, you could kind of divide them into Durkin being the clear establishment favorite. She kind of inherited a lot of the coalition that was going to make uh, Ed Murray a shoe in uh, four short months ago. Uh, and, you know, business as usual is this Jimmy Durkin. Uh, that's what people want with her. They want some continuity in, in uh, what's a booming economy and growing population and so forth. Um, Oliver and uh, Moon and Hasegawa ran as outsiders. They, they ran wanting changes in the status quo. Um, uh, Justin Farrell, I think, was also uh, appealing a lot to uh, urbanism and you know, increased density and so forth. And if you look at those five candidates and divide them into, you know, Farrell, Durkin versus uh, Moon or Hasegawa, it comes about about even. Um, there were about 60,000 more voters in 2013 for the general than there were for the primary. That's probably about what we'll see again this year. And those people are uh, skew younger, they skew uh, less affluent, less uh, white than uh, the voters in the primary. And that's going to determine um, uh, who wins in November in the mayor's race. And it's really in, um, I think Oliver's going to be pivotal in that, in, in what she encourages for people to do. Uh, I said, I said Moon would be smart to try and offer Oliver a place in her administration if she wins. Uh, for that reason, that, that she needs to demonstrate that she's serious about incorporating some of those policy positions. Um, and we'll see what the voters who were not civically engaged enough to turn out for the primary, but well for the general. We'll see how they fall on that. Can I add something real quick? Yeah, sure. Um, I, well, I would break down the, the voters a little bit differently. I think Carrie Moon's voters are very much just barrel voters. I mean, um, if, if people vote on policy, and I'm like, I very much hope and wish that everybody votes on policy always, but I know that they don't. Um, but I think Mike McGinn voters are, um, you know, are more likely to be, you know, sort of in, in the other camp, you know, in the Nikita Oliver camp. So I, I think, you know, right now you are kind of looking at two urbanists, um, and you are looking at two people who are various degrees of the same policies that we've had already. I don't think Carrie Moon is that radically different than 
at Murray in terms of what she would actually do as mayor. I mean, I think she is different, but, and I think Jenny Durbin is much more similar, and I think in some ways more conservative than Murray, but, um, uh, so that would definitely be a continuation of the same, but I wouldn't fool ourselves to think that, you know, that Carrie Moon is going to be, you know, a sort of Mikita Oliver substitute in any way. Yeah, so, well, I, I actually did uh, take a peek at, like, the last couple of mineral collections, and, you know, I thought it was really interesting that, you know, in the past, the past couple of cycles, there's been, um, there were, like, two, in the primary, there were two people who were uh, pretty much high, you know, it's, like, about 20%, you know, two people get 20% of the vote. This time, it's, like, you know, I think it'll be, um, you know, interesting to see if you're, Prediction comes true, or your analysis comes true to see if, like, they, um, you know, people coalesce around like that. That three people actually represented one person, you know, and, and that's kind of how that broke, broke down. But you know, kind of look at the the pattern. I think it's a little bit different of a pattern that we've seen in the past couple of elections, where there were kind of two very clear front runners, and uh, you know. But yeah, I don't think that we can kind of necessarily assume that you know there was you know that there's like a Nikita and Carrie Frog coalition and then they're all gonna they're all gonna fall in line. Yeah, I I I see that, you know, I you know, I want my potholes to be taken care of and I want like these basic you know, these you know, public parks to be well cared for and you know, and maybe she's talking about that in a way that people you know, like thirty percent of the people kind of had to, you know, as well as like, you know, being able to you know, address some of the other issues. I, you know, I think that that's the, um, but at least, you know, kind of with the people that I know, and I think that was kind of the main thing that they were really concerned, or that's what they talk about a lot, just kind of the growth and, you know, what, who can stay in Seattle and who's the city, you know, who will get to stay in the city for the next four years. That's, you know, kind of the main, uh, you know, like that's kind of the issue, right? Yeah, I, I think there's there's two issues that uh, distinguish Moon Durkin, or will distinguish Moon Durkin, and there's a huge elephant in the room. The two issues are affordability, which, um, uh, again, transparency, everyone I know cares about it, people who are comfortable enough where it's not a worry, I'm not getting the people in my social circles. Um, but um, uh, how Moon distinguishes herself from Durkin on that. Durkin has talked about sort of nibbling around the edges of that in terms of the reforms that she's. Um, Proposed, and I, if I were running Moon's campaign, I think I would stake out uh, a much more proactive position on that. I think it's a, a clear and easy way um, to distinguish yourself and also necessary public policy. Um, the other area, which isn't a top of mind issue for a lot of people, but it's a clear difference and matters a lot, what matters to it is police reform. Uh, Durkin's uh, strength, for better and worse, is her law enforcement background. It's what people know her for. Um, she's been very effective. She's a U.S. attorney, a prosecutor, etc. Uh, on the other hand, if you're concerned about SPD and about police reform, uh, that can be reason to be very skeptical about So I think that's going to make a difference to, to a lot of people. The other thing in the room is that the economy in Seattle right now is really, really good uh, compared to where it's been a lot of times in the past. And people don't talk about that, they just assume it and really kind of take it for granted. That's not true in a lot of the rest of the country, and it's one of the reasons a lot of people are moving here right now. Um, and uh, since I write nationally as well as locally, keep your eye on the federal government's ability to, Congress's ability to raise the debt ceiling at the end of September and to get our federal budget done because um, we could be in a recession by the time the November election rolls around or by the time the ballots are mailed in September or October. And uh, that might uh, color uh, the election very differently than the environment in which the primary was held in August. Uh, if you're looking at losses of federal funds, if you're looking at uh, companies like Amazon having a slowing their growth, then suddenly you're uh, having discussions about what are the priorities in the sales budget, how are we going to take care of social needs with less money, et cetera. Those kind of discussions really weren't really happening in that context in the primary, and they might be by November. Oh, I have to so, oh, just to add on to your point about um, police reform, I think that you know, with a lot of the, 
But with a lot of the coverage that we have, and a lot of the people that um, you know we talk to, police reform is a huge issue, and you know, and obviously, you know, um, Nikita you know, Oliver was, you know, was on those campaigns, you know, for um, the you know uh, for police reform, and so I. You know, I think that it's important to a lot of people. I guess when, you know, when I'm thinking about the question and the way that it's framed here, I guess, you know, just kind of looking at the results, I was thinking that, you know, it didn't seem that that was like a huge issue on maybe the majority of Seattle voters' minds. And so that's kind of like why I think, you know, I, I think it's, um, it'll be interesting to see if it becomes more of an important issue, especially when you kind of, when people try to take a look at the difference between Carrie Blue and Jenny Durkin, if that's going to emerge as kind of another, you know, kind of way for people to, to differentiate the two. So. Um, so I know a lot of people who did vote for Jenny. Um, I mean, more who voted for, for Nikita, I would say, but um, I think people who voted for Jenny did it because, I mean, or, or at least a lot of people I know and talked to, um, it's because, you know, it was, it's, she is a continuation of Ed Murray, and Ed Murray, I mean, you know, before his scandal was pretty popular. And in fact, you know, when, when she, before like sort of the latest round of, um, of scandal was, you know, was rolled out, rolled out in the Seattle Times, um, Jenny Durkin was very proud to, endo to announce his endorsement uh, because the thinking was that was gonna get her a lot of votes, right? So, I mean, Ed Murray's policies, you know, you know are actually quite popular and I think he would have won if he hadn't had all this you know, if he hadn't had the scandal, um, I think he would have had a pretty easy route to re-election. And um, I know that's conventional wisdom, but I think it's conventional wisdom for a reason. So that's, I mean, the people I know who voted for Jenny were Ed supporters. Oh, oh sorry. Great, so the arts tax. What do you think it means that the proposed sales tax for art, science, and culture failed? There is no formal opposition, but voters narrowly rejected it. Yeah, um, the best cause in the world, and having you know underprivileged kids have better access to the arts, is a cause that I don't think anybody is against. It's a great idea, um, but uh, the state legislature had just approved. Uh, what amounts to a massive property tax increase that will affect both homeowners and renters in Seattle to a significant degree. Uh, the sales tax proposal on top of that tax burden itself is also uh, because of the sales tax, because uh, in our state tax structure there are limited options for how to raise money. Um, it's a pretty regressive tax. And I think between those two things, it wasn't that the issue itself was unpopular, it's that the, the method for funding it and the timing of it was unpopular. I think the fact that the property tax increase that had been announced uh, with the education deal from the budget at the state legislature, if that had been announced four months ago, that uh, proposed, that arts tax probably passes. If the arts tax had been on the ballot in November rather than this time uh, and didn't have another uh, Love to compete against because there's a uh, it's a veterans levy uh, on ballot in November. It probably passes. It. It'll be very interesting to see if that other levy in November passes. Um, uh, once we're a little bit farther out, of course, if we have problems with the economy, that's going to impact it as well. But it really is more a referendum on the tax burden, I think, than it is on the issue. Well, okay. So I mean, I, I don't know if I've had anything like cycle to add to that. I think that, that, that there is um, a, a little bit of, well, there's a, a concern about, you know, um, but how much, you know, about how much people are spending, you know, like the rents are going up. And, you know, it's like, you know, asking people to, you know, pay an additional sales tax might be just too, too big of a burden to lift at this time. And, you know, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't get this question ahead of time, so I didn't see, like, kind of, if there's any kind of geographical breakdown in terms of, like, where, where this, uh, the, the tax passed and you know where I mean it, it was kind of it sounds like it was kind of close so you know, it's probably pretty narrow like you know who you know where it was supported and where it wasn't but you know I think that um, just sort of general affordability especially with rising rent and um, you know that that's I think that that those are major those are major factors as well. Um, I I actually think the issue did have something to do with it because um, uh, you know I think. 
there's there the Seattle Times editorial against it was you know essentially saying that the arts are frivolous. I mean, it, uh, they had other reasons in it, you know, around tax fatigue and this is too much and when will the voters you know say no finally to a tax and they did. Um, but I think you know I mean I know people who voted for who vote for every tax in the world who voted against this thing and I was like you know I asked them why and they said well. You know, it just seems like the arts, like with all the concerns we have, with homelessness, with the vets levy coming up, with all this, you know, all the really pressing concerns that, you know, arts just seems like a uh, frivolity. And I think they didn't really, the campaign didn't translate it into, like, this is education for children. Um, and, you know, and there was, there's just this sense still, I think, that, you know, that arts are just an extracurricular thing in science, you know, and it's just, sort of something we can pay for after we pay for the actually essential stuff. And I don't agree with that. I mean, I voted for it, but um, but I think that was uh, a sentiment that was out there. Yeah, and in terms of the issue, I think the other factor is people look at the arts and, you know, they say, well, why should, uh, say, you know, poor people with aggressive tax pay for this when, I know, there are plenty of wealthy philanthropists in the city who support the arts. And particularly when you look at the institutions that this has gone to, things like the zoo, uh, the, the SAM, etc. Um, you know, let the people who are already philanthropists pay for this rather than, than having taxpayers pay for it. So I think that might have been a factor too. Oh. So we focused a lot on the mayor and city council. Next question, just to open it up to the panelists on the other campaign. So. Any uh, amazing insights on campaigns for school board or Port of Seattle or even the state legislature? <laughs> um, I'm really excited about the 45th. Yeah. Um, that's uh, Marka Dengra um, is a uh, Democratic candidate in the state legislature to replace um, the uh, late Senator Andy Hill. Um, and she took more than 50% of the vote in a you know traditionally Republican district that is really actually a Democratic district now um, against um, a woman who's very well funded. Um, she's another woman of color um, who moved here I think six months ago. Republic Republican Party is running her, um, and um, I think voters weren't fooled. Um, she's running it's a very very the Republican woman is extremely conservative, very socially conservative, and I think that is not in line in any way with the values of the 45th district anymore. So if she wins, if Manka Dengra, the Democrat, wins, um, the um, you know the Senate's going to flip. That's really significant. And then we'll see if the Democrats actually you know have something, have some legislation, and have some muscle to put behind their actual power if they can take the Senate back. Because now they only have um, a nominal majority, um, meaning the um, the one Democrat, Tim Sheldon, uh, votes with the Republicans every time. So. Um, so this would be a real majority. Yeah, that, that was very much at the top of my list as well. And then uh, I would say for both the port and the school board, and you know, we see these things cycle around, but there's a prospect in both of those institutions uh, of having a majority of reform-minded candidates uh, come out of the November election. Um, a lot of the problems with the school board and with the board are institutional and they have to do also with the, uh, the part-time uh, underfunded nature of the boards that oversee them. Uh, a lot of those uh, the decisions are made by the superintendent, the board CEO, and senior staff, and there are institutional um, uh, cultures there that are deeply problematic. I won't go into the reasons for that. But every uh, every few years, you get uh, reform majorities on the board commission or on the Seattle school board that uh, try and rein that in somewhat. And I think we might be due for another cycle of that. I would say that the 45th was also kind of at the top of my head because I also I live in, I live on the east side too, so that's like you know, not important to you guys necessarily. But you know, I think that the uh, but it, it does have an impact on. Um, you know, the balance of the state, the state legislature. So I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of money being poured into that race. And I think that's, uh, um, you know, yeah, I think that that's, that's going to be an interesting race to watch. So I hope all of you Seattle folks will watch that race really closely. Although, yeah, it, it's going to be interesting how it turns out because, you know, my figure did get more than 50% of the vote. So, um, you know, and we might have a more liberal electorate yeah. in the general. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and I think that people um, kind of uh, 
characterize the Eastside as being you know, you know, more conservative. I guess it is kind of like compared to Seattle, but it's actually, um, you know, uh, I would say that it's not as conservative as maybe people assume that it is. So. Yeah, the, the, the demographics of the 45th are not what you think they are anymore. Just a couple more questions from me, and then we'll open up to a few audience questions. But we are we're staying on time, so appreciate everybody's attention and patience. Um, in terms of uh, organizations like the Seattle Neighborhood Coalition. What is your what is your advice to to organizations, um, particularly neighborhood based ones, that would like to try to influence the candidates or the outcome of the election? Is it do they try to have a sit down with the candidates? Do they give money? Uh, do they sort of uh, have press conferences? What how what are some ways to influence the candidates and the outcome of the election if you're an organization? Um. I'm not sure you can. <laughs> uh, you know, neighborhood groups have really been shut out of policy meeting in Seattle for the last decade, uh, pretty systematically. And I don't know if that changes this time. I think Moon is probably a little more open to it than, than uh, Durkin is, but not necessarily. I think uh, the perception out there, which is, is accurate in some cases, not accurate in, in others, is that neighborhood groups are united and uh, unknown for what they're against rather than what they're for. And to the extent that neighborhood groups can put forward proactive, positive uh, proposals for how to deal with things like homelessness, how to deal with things like upzoning, issues that impact neighborhoods, uh, protecting small businesses that are, are being threatened by, by the internet and high large chains, um, what, what the city can do to help those businesses. Um, the more that those neighborhood groups can be proactive as opposed to just saying, we don't want this cited here, uh, because the neighborhood groups have been losing those battles consistently for some time now, and I don't think that's likely to change soon. Mm -hmm. So, um, I actually, I think that um, for the average, so I've got like two kind of, two thoughts on this, so I'll try to be quick. The, the um, uh, as far as like the average voters aren't as well connected as, or like as plugged in as most people who would be involved in the neighborhood group. So I, I do actually think that endorsements, if that's something that you can be doing, like, you know, because I think that most people will be kind of just kind of going, okay, so who endorsed what, and do I agree with what they, you know, do I agree with this group, and I'm just gonna like go down the, go down my ballot and mark the same things and use a cheat sheet. And so I do think that that's actually, that, that, that is worth your time. To, to try to to try to determine that if that's something that you want to if you want to kind of influence the outcome of the election, and um, and I kind of and then the second thing that I would I would also add and I think that this is just kind of a spiel I always have is just you know to um, kind of just make sure that uh, you're reaching out to everybody in your neighborhoods that it's not just you know some of the neighborhood you know that you are representing and you know that there's like um, kind of representation in terms of uh, you know. Uh, you know your, uh, you know your neighbors of color, and your, you know, and women and, and different ages, and you know different genders, and, and so um, I think that that's also important for neighborhoods to just make a concerted effort to for the, that kind of inclusion, because I also think that there are people who kind of look at um, you know certain groups and they go, well, they don't represent me, they didn't ask me, they have totally different concerns of what I do, so I'm going to take a cheat sheet, I'm going to vote exactly the opposite of what you did anyway, which is it. So, um, you know, I think that in order to have an impact, and in order to have a continual impact, you, you should kind of like look look around and see kind of like what are we doing to like really kind of meaningfully engage with all of our neighbors and make sure that, um, you know, that uh, we have, um, you know, and, and it's going to be sometimes a messier process, but I think that that's actually good and we might end up with a, with a better result. I think one interesting thing, I, I totally agree with all that. I think one interesting thing that, um, that has happened in some neighborhood councils um, since uh, the city uh, removed, you know, sort of formal affiliation with the neighborhood group, with the neighborhood councils is that, um, you know, you have seen more people kind of trying to come in who are renters um, and who are younger. Um, and um, and that those those folks are part of your neighborhood too, you know. I mean, I, I live in Jenkins Park. I'm very invested in my neighborhood, but I am also a renter. 
um, and probably a little bit younger than the demographic in most neighborhood groups. Um, so I think outreach to those folks is just a general, you know, relevancy. Um, I mean, a good a good rule of thumb for just remaining relevant, um, you know, in politics and in the city. Um, I also think, you know, try meeting with Jenny Dirk and try meeting with Carrie Moon. I mean, try meeting with Teresa and John too, because. Um, I know that, um, I mean, I've never, I'm not a campaign person, but I know that at City Hall, um, people are really influenced by the people they meet with. Um, and I mean, they're influenced by letters. Um, and um, it, it, it's that personal touch that actually does tend to influence policy um, in a way that is, you know, out of proportion to, um, you know, I mean, not out of proportion, uh, but that is um, worth your time. I guess um, you know you, you may spend an hour talking to um, a candidate or city council member, you know, in a group, and, and bring a proactive policy and say, "Hey, look, this is a problem in our neighborhood. This is something that we want to fix, and here's our solution for fixing it." Um, and that actually, you know, might show up at a you know in a, in a campaign platform or on somebody's desk when they get elected. So I mean, don't discount the power of you know spending your time. And, and actually trying to do that one-on-one -on -one outreach to candidates, because sometimes it does make a difference. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I agree with all that, and there's a reason companies hire lobbyists. Um, you know, the, the general rule of thumb is FaceTime is best, after that phone calls, after that letters, handwritten letters, and after that uh, emails. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the more time and the more, uh, uh, the more personal the contact is, uh, it's not and it does have an influence on that proportion. What do you think it might? Give that back to Eric because I've got a minute. Got any batteries? Uh, this is the last question from me, um, but but I can comment a little bit on that. Having worked for a city council member, you know what what is it that they're paying attention to? And each one is a little bit different. You know, they're often looking at well, who got them elected? Who's going to get them elected again? Um, you know who, who their base is, who who their loyalists are. Uh, I think they agree with philosophically. Um, you know, it certainly helps when I've seen other council offices and, and people be influenced in the administrations be influenced by groups that um, can make formal endorsements, as Ben has said, and also have money behind them. You know, it's, it's, it's not that they're, they're going to want the money from the group, but it's, it just signifies additional power and influence. And, you know, what is their membership, how big is their membership, do, do they make endorsements, do they provide money to campaigns or to independent expenditures, that, that sort of thing. So to always keep trying to expand your, uh, and like Ben has said, you know, expand your base, you know, reach out to others, build, build the organization, make it stronger. So the last question, uh, just any predictions for the general election that you want to share? Knowing that we might all be wrong. Female mayor. I'm a hundred percent. Um, you know, I think. Uh, you know, I think. I, well, I alluded a little bit to it earlier when I was talking about like the when we were all talking about like the issues, but I think it's it is going to be just sort of like the. Um, you know, it always feels like that, right? It's like, oh, this is. This is over the whole Seattle, but it, like, it, this, it actually kind of feels like that this time. I mean, just because we are kind of at a at a point where it's like the growth is really fast and the rents are rising really fast, and it, you know, and um, the demographics are changing really fast. Like a lot of um, people of color are leaving Seattle for um, more affordable places to live. I mean, I live in Bellevue because we can't afford to move back to Seattle, right? And so, yeah. That's, I mean, they'll be, you know, and so the, um, the, uh, and I think that that's, uh, I mean, it almost kind of feels like, well, who, you know, we're, we're, this is kind of a point where we're talking about, like, okay, so who, you know, uh, we're trying to pick leaders who are going to um, figure out a way to, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, uh, just make the decisions about who is going to stay, right? And I, I feel like that's, like, almost kind of a, uh, you know, an apocalyptic way to talk about it, but it's like I think that that's kind of the you know the feeling that a lot of people have in terms of like you know so who I you know choose to back with you know that person is going to affect whether I get to stay here or whether in the next four years I'm, I'm going to have to you know move to a more affordable or more affordable city. So 
Yeah, I, I think if it's if the uh, general election, especially for mayor, but also for uh, city council uh, position eight, if that becomes a referendum on uh, Seoul, Seattle, as, as Venice says, then it's a very different kind of election than if it doesn't turn into that. If it doesn't turn into that, I think Jane Durkin wins for the city. Um, if, uh, if there are clear differences between Durkin and Moon on what they see the future of Seattle uh, looking like, then I think it's a much more competitive race. Uh, uh, same thing for, uh, uh, for uh, the city council race. Uh, John Grant has made affordability pretty central to both his race this year and his race two years ago. Um, uh, Teresa Muscata also has uh, obviously worked on minimum wage and has other uh, issues having to do with standard of living and affordability. Um, to the degree that they distinguish themselves and how they distinguish themselves, that's going to be determined also. So we're, we're about ready for audience questions. Is there anything else the panelists want to want to add before we before I go up to the folks? I have one, yeah, one quick thing about yeah. Carrie Moon, um, and I and I don't I don't mean to be down on her. Um, yeah, I, I like Carrie a lot, and I've known her for a long time. Um, I do think that um, it's going to be hard for her to. I mean, to, I, I, we'll see. And like I said, always wrong. But um, she. Um, comes across as a little bit dilettante-ish, um, and I use that word advisedly because she's just she's never been in pol involved in politics before, and I'm not sure what she stands for. So she's going to have a really, I think, tough road to distinguish herself from Jenny Durkin, and also to really inspire people because, you know, as you said, you know, it is kind of a choice between two rich white ladies or people who were really inspired by Nikita. So I think that's going to be, you know, a, a real challenge for her. Um, <clears throat> neither uh, Gherkin nor uh, Moon are really that well defined. Gherkin is sort of perceived as the establishment candidate. Um, Moon, I, yeah, other than her coming across as personable and, and thoughtful, um, yeah, a, a well funded candidate like Gherkin will have uh, can define Moon before she knows what's happening. And, uh, and vice versa, uh, Gherkin be, can be defined by Moon. So I think the circumstances and, and what those two campaigns decide to do uh, is going to have uh, more impact than it usually does because neither of them has held elected office before, because neither of them had great name familiarity with most voters before this year, even though they've both you know, been involved in, in the city in different ways. Um, so uh, a lot can change between now and then. <coughs> So we can take audience questions. Let me come out and be filled. Does anybody remember Phil Donahue? Am I the only one? Hi, <laughs> Janine Reese, West Seattle Junction Neighborhood Organization. I don't know if any of you have looked at the draft environmental impact statement for HALA, but one of the things that I saw upon review of the draft environmental impact statement that concerned me a great deal and nobody is talking about was related to the um, statement about sewer lines in the city of Seattle that are 12 inches or less in diameter are many times at capacity or already over capacity. And those sewer lines, it stated, would have to be upgraded during the course of development. Then the draft EIS refers you back to the 2035 Comprehensive Plan draft EIS, where they do discuss capacity-constrained sewers that are 12 inches or less. The difference is, is that particular EIS for the comp plan actually gives you a City of Seattle sewer map that shows you that virtually 90% of the sewer lines in the City of Seattle are 12 inches or less. So there's a city sewer map. It's really interesting, and I'm an infrastructure nerd. I happen to look up the sewer lines in the West Seattle Junction urban village, and I counted 32 blocks that are 12 inches or less, and most of those are actually 8 inches, vitreous clay sewer lines. So I see massive infrastructure investment in the future that nobody is talking about, and massive street terror. Why doesn't anybody <coughs> talk about this? It's huge, and it's expensive. 
Um, I can tell you exactly why nobody's talking about it, because the city of Seattle has successfully put off infrastructure investment for years and years and years and years and ignored it. And um, I think the working assumption is, well, we can keep doing it. You know, we've had 100,000 people in the last six years. It doesn't have an impact, right? Uh, and, you know, I'm not an infrastructure nerd. Uh, I don't necessarily know the details of the sewer lines. I know that the sewer lines have not been upgraded in most of the city in a very long time, and a lot of those are aging. I know that there's a backlog of, of street and bridge investment that goes back over a decade, um, including, uh, you know, infrastructure that was damaged in this fall earthquake now 16 years ago that has not been addressed. Um, there's just a whole long list of infrastructure needs that Seattle will, will need just to keep pace with where it has been, let alone accommodating all the new development. And, um, you know, part of that, I think, is that um, we're allowed, we're encouraging the density, we're encouraging the population growth without having a comprehensive plan that anybody's paying any attention to for uh, keeping up with that in terms of not just infrastructure, utilities, etc., but schools and parks and all the other things that people newly moving to Seattle will, will need to uh, use in terms of government services. We're just not prepared for it. The schools are overflowing right now. Remember five, six years ago when people were upset that, that schools were being closed? That's not the problem now. Um, and you can just go down the list of things that, that are going to require a lot of money going forward. And that. Well, I think you know um, one of the one of the reasons that that stuff doesn't get discussed. I mean, a, it's not sexy, but b, um, what happens? I mean, the city would probably have to increase taxes to pay for things like an entire you know citywide sewer upgrade or an entire you know, citywide uh, sidewalk program. And people are often shocked at how much that costs. And I mean, it's incredibly expensive. You can't really see it, um, you know, you replace the whole sewer system and, you know, what do you get? You get ripped up streets that people complain about. So it's ne that's never gonna be a popular issue for, uh, for people to campaign on, I think, because, or people to really, you know, in political office to really make their key issue because, um, you know, upgrading stuff is a pain in the butt. I live on 23rd, and um, they, uh, they, you know, I mean, that thing has been torn up, I don't know how many years. And, um, you know, and, and all you hear is complaints about the traffic, complaints about the reroutes. I mean, just, you know, it's, it's not, you're not gonna win any, you know, any votes on ripping up somebody's street. Um, and it's very, very expensive. Sidewalks are shockingly expensive. Sewers are shockingly expensive. And so if you're gonna ask people to raise taxes for that, you know, it's, it's just, it's a hard case to make. I mean, it's not the kind of thing that people necessarily wanna vote for um, as much as they wanna vote for stuff that's really obvious. I think Parks is a good example where you actually do have some traction, you know, and it is a popular thing to campaign on. But, you know, just basic and boring infrastructure, that's, you know, that's a really hard sell, I think. So I was, I was, I passed the mic because I was trying to think of a way of, a nice way of putting this, but it really isn't. I, I think, I agree with, you know, with, with what everyone said, and I, um, I think you're not going to get the attention on it until, like, really, you know, you get, like, some kind of, I don't know, like a sewer catastrophe, or, like, people's toilets stop flushing, or, you know, whatever it is that, that, that has to happen. That, we that, had a sewer know, catastrophe. Yeah, we did have, we did have a sewer <laughs> catastrophe, but, you know, like, until that becomes, I guess, a, you know, like a, major issue or, or like you know the kind of a regular thing that happens I, I don't think you're going to get the the attention that maybe um that that you know like something so basic kind of deserves so yeah and you know it's, that, that's kind of unfortunate and we're going to let our cameraman ask the next question hey uh i was noticing uh, the other day that when trump was coming down on his house speaker he uh used the infrastructure as the very last item that he wanted him to accomplish which was infrastructure he wanted a bunch of social issues first so, so i kind of see that in seattle here where um we have kind of um a, a smaller emphasis on the environment and i'm just wondering if you think that uh the uh, rash of development is going to uh, make our candidates and successful elected officials think that uh, we should uh, control the, de the development so that it doesn't uh, obliterate the urban forest. 
Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna push back on that a little bit because because um, our I mean our urban forest is not in danger of being obliterated at this moment. Um, yes. uh, <laughs> I think obliteration is a really is it's a really down to twenty eight percent. So we're but, but but we are doing better in terms of our urban forest. That I mean, go to San Francisco. It is. I mean, and, and this is one reason I don't like going there, frankly, and I like living in Seattle, is it is a very green city. Um, now, our urban forest is incredibly important. It's important to, you know, both, you know, the environment, the livability of the city, all of that. Um, I think that um, when you talk about, particularly with the two candidates who have made it through in the mayoral race, I think both of them are going to think about the environment a little bit differently. And part of that is um, is preventing sprawl. And you know, if you believe that, you know, as I do, that Amazon's going to keep expanding, you know, whether we tell them to or not, people are going to be moving here, and so we need to find a place for them to go, right? And so the question is, how do we do that, and how do we increase, you know, the housing options for those folks without doing, without, as you say, obliterating the urban forest because nobody wants that. But I think you're going to see these two candidates talking about things in terms of where do we put density, how do we grow density, and I think this is actually one, one unfortunate thing about Jessen Farrell not, make, not making it through because I think she had some of the most interesting ideas about densifying neighborhoods with neighborhood um, participation and consent, essentially, um, as opposed to, you know, sort of seeing what we see now, what I'm seeing in my neighborhood, which is, you know, these four-pack townhomes, you know, and six-pack townhomes going up and they're all identical and they, you know, they really are kind of, you know, they're, they're changing the character of the neighborhood for the worse. Um, so I think there's going to be a discussion about that, but it's not going to be about whether we grow, it's going to be about how we grow. Okay. Maybe that is okay. Well, it just seems to me that considering that uh, we are have to deal with this massive growth and this unaffordability, that we need a bold vision counter to the current one, which is uh, to throw sops to the uh, developers. And uh, I think that since Seattle extends from Burien up to 145th Street and our millions of, or uh, hundreds of thousands of middle-class people that uh, could turn their house into a, a duplex or have an accessory unit, that, that would be more than adequate to deal. Uh, this could be a bold vision and counter to what we're seeing. And I just wondered uh, what your comments might be on this. <laughs> well, I, I think, you know, Ed Murray actually proposed that along with, you know, a lot of other stuff in HALA that, you know, I know probably a lot of folks in this room didn't support. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think it would be great to see if that, if that and this is actually an issue where I think neighborhoods could be influential with these campaigns. I mean, go out there and say, look, because, you know, I agree, I mean, that's a, that would be a really good solution if people were interested and willing in making extra to make extra income by renting out a duplex or renting out an apartment in their backyard um, you know that seems like it could be a winning issue to me and it also seems like an area where if there was some kind of consensus um, in neighborhood groups um, to say look we don't want you know we don't necessarily want 65 foot apartments but we would accept you know duplexes we would accept backyard cottages um, you know, go out and lobby for that because I think that's a really, um, you know, that, that's, that seems like an obvious solution. I think at one point it was an obvious solution. And then I think Hala came around and that was part of Hala. And, um, and when people were, you know, sort of rejecting Hala wholesale, that was part of the rejection was, you know, let's not have, and so now we, can, we, we lost the duplexes, we lost the possibility of backyard cottages for now there's a big lawsuit going on. Um, so I think that's that's an area where neighborhood groups could be influential with, with either of the mayoral candidates and with the city council, too. I also uh, I agree with all that. I also think that's getting, that kind of solution is getting less emphasis uh, so far this year because the scale of the growth in, the Seattle, in Seattle right now is so dramatic that depending on individual homeowners or property owners, to do property conversions or upgrades. Um, it's just not as efficient as uh, 
working with a developer who can put up a, a hundred or five hundred units at a time. Um, and, and that size of growth in housing capacity is, is really what's urgently needed in Seattle right now to keep up with the population growth. So I think it's taken a little bit of a bad seat, but I don't think that kind of proposal is going to go away because uh, it seemed like common sense three years ago and the common sense really hasn't changed that much. I, I definitely would agree with everything everyone said, except that I do I do think that um, you know that it's uh, yeah it's a non, it's an issue that I'll come back and it'll it's a solution that's going to be talked about again just because I it, you know like while it doesn't provide the type of scale that um, you know that's that's needed in the city it does it is something that can help keep an existing owner in their home if they you know if they're able to like you know rent out. You know, or convert the basement, or like build build a cottage in the backyard, and then they, you know, and and, uh, and have some income that helps them stay in the city. So I, I don't think that that's going to be an un unpopular uh, issue, but it's yeah, not the thing that's getting the most. Thing at the moment. And I think one thing Peter Steinberg used to always say was um, that you know that I mean his favorite city was Barcelona. Barcelona is much more dense than Seattle, and it has, um, I'm not sure what the population is, but it's an incredibly dense city, but if you've ever been there, it's not tall. Um, so if you don't want your neighborhood to be tall, I mean, I, I don't think the, all of Seattle needs to be skyscrapers. I don't think there needs to be a skyscraper in the middle of a neighborhood. I mean, that's that's not the way I think anybody wants to develop, right? So there are ways to densify um, to the extent that we need that in some neighborhoods are gonna look like skyscrapers, in some neighborhoods it's gonna look like 12-story buildings, in some neighborhoods it's gonna look like backyard cottages. And I think the, the thing the thing that we need to do and the thing that I hope these you know the candidates and the city council continues working toward is um, is figuring out how to do that on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis. And uh, Barcelona just elected a radical young new mayor on this on the model of Keanu Oliver specifically who ran on affordability issues. So uh, these, these things aren't just the other problems. <coughs> we, have lots of, we have lots of questions. Lots of questions from the audience. I'm, I'm going to be unpopular very quickly uh, as I skip over. But we're going to get back to you. So I promise this gentleman, there you go. I don't think the mic's working. I don't think <laughs> well, here, let me try again. That's Jane. It's, I think the batteries is failing. So. I have a question about harm reduction. I saw a photo, I think, in the paper of all the candidates with their hands in the air saying they favor safe injection sites in order to reduce harm. But uh, what's not included in the equation is the harm that the people do in order to get the heroin to inject at the safe injection sites. In particular, uh, two days ago, early in the morning, I don't know exactly when, somebody broke into my house and stole a thousand dollars worth of video equipment. So Unfortunately, what? Oh, I was going to say safe injection sites. Well, uh, so the, the, Unfortunately, uh, the equipment they stole had the image from the images from all of the uh, security cameras, so I don't know who it was. So the question is, uh, what role will safe injection sites play in this election? Uh, since the jurisdiction for that at present is the county, I don't think it plays that much of a role. Um, the, the, the selling point for safe injection sites, and the problem is that in terms of public support, it's counterintuitive, is that when you offer safe injective site, injection sites in Vancouver and other cities where it's done, uh, the, the premise is that people are going to use anyway, and by offering safe sites, uh, it reduces some of the, the, the harm that goes with them. They're not having a safe place to use. Uh, but it also means that more people uh, seek out treatment programs and eventually get off uh, of whatever uh, addictive substance they're on. And that really is the, the end line result. So then, uh, the idea is that long term, it prevents crime, it prevents uh, addiction. And that's the real long term public policy goal. The problem is really intuitive that people look at that and, and you're, you're, uh, you're, you're countenancing uh, criminal acts, you're countenancing uh, drug addiction. The idea is to get people off of drugs and the assumption is it's going to happen whether we ban it or not. Uh, what can we do to try and uh, 
trying to ameliorate it. But uh, again, I don't think it's going to play that much of a role in the election since the only uh, significant uh, countywide race is Al Constantine, and he's going to pretty much post to the election. That's when we have serious opposition. Are we talking about banning safe consumption sites? Yeah. We're talking about harm reduction. But, uh, uh, the equation is not, does not include the victims of the crime that's incurred getting the heroin to inject at the safe injection sites. So, um, and all the uh, candidates said they're in favor of safe injection sites. So the question is, what role will this play in city politics? So I think, um, so all the candidates have said they're in favor of doing the pilot, I believe. And so, um, if there, so that means there's going to be one in Seattle if the pilot goes forward as planned, which, you know, it's kind of a little unclear at this point. Um, I think um, Jeannie Cole Wells um, was responding to a question like this the other day at the county, the county council, and she said, you know, look, it's not going to be in a neighborhood that doesn't want it. And I think we do have neighborhoods that actually do want it, particularly Capitol Hill. Um, I would expect, I mean, this is, this is just my guess based on what people on Capitol Hill have said, is that it's much more likely to go somewhere like there, where the people already are. Um, they're already, we already have a massive heroin problem in the city. People are already using it. Um, and so when you have a safe consumption site, I mean, as job was saying, the idea is to get people off of drugs, right? It's not to enable them or to keep the, or to sort of, you know, encourage heroin use. Um, but you get people inside and you've improved a lot of things. You've improved the fact that they're not shooting up on the street. Um, and they're not growing needles on the street because there's a place for them to get fresh needles and turn and you know put their needles in a container and it's not in your face. Um, so I think I think that actually um, you know there's potential to improve neighborhoods, but um, but on the other hand, I also think it's not going to be in Magnolia. It's not going to be in Ballard. Um, I think. Um, How about you know, your district? Well, I mean, I'm not a policymaker, but you know, I mean, I think that it's going to be where. Where the where the users already are, and there are a lot of users, drug users in the U district. So yeah, where the deal exchange is. Okay, I think we're right. We've got about ten other people. Um, so let's go next. Thank you. I'm going to do something a little bit different. Um, I'm curious what you all, um, and I don't mean to be disparaging in small press, think about how Seattle is perceived in large press. Um, and for example. You know, we, we see quotes from mayors on certain issues in the national news. And so my question is, of the two mayoral candidates, do you have a sense of, uh, as you've been watching, who's the most grounded and who can, um, uh, I guess, carry the image of Sparky Seattle, uh, which has been our history, as opposed to just all about development Seattle? <laughs> I'm looking at job because you've been here the longest. Okay. Um, I think uh, it's actually something that Ed Murray was very good at, was being a representative of Seattle nationally and internationally. Um, and I think Durkin would carry on a lot of that same kind of image. I think Carrie Moon is a little bit of a wild card in that way. She could be in that way. She could be a very effective spokesperson for Seattle. We just don't know. Uh, we'll know a lot more, I think, by November. Um, I would be pretty comfortable with either one of them. They're both quite personable, they're both quite knowledgeable and articulate. And um, Seattle has a pretty good image nationally and internationally right now. We've got one of the best economies in the country. Uh, we're perceived as a fairly global city, even though affordability is an issue here as in a number of other US cities. Um, so they, I, I don't think that's going to be a serious problem going forward, at least with the two finalists that we have. So speaking of affordability, it seems to be an extremely response to my question about about like so I guess what, about who's going to be like a a best yeah the best spokesperson for Seattle I, yeah I, I don't know I think I I agree with Joe but it's a it's um uh, well you know I don't know that anybody. I don't no, I, I guess it, I didn't, at least the people that I know aren't making a decision based on like who's, um, you know, you know, who's going to be on TV all the time and who's going to be, you know, NBC News and, and like, and make all the chat shows. I guess that that's, um, 
But, um, you know, because that's, uh, you know, like almost like a beauty contest type of question. And so I, I, you know, I don't mean to like discourage your question, but you know, it kind of, I, I, I think that both, um, both Jenny Dirk and, and Carrie Moon would be, you know, I guess that they, you know, like I kind of see potential for both of them being like, you know, on TV a lot, and, you know, and sponsored and things, things for people to see how it I think anybody would be better um, than Ed Murray at this particular point. Um, the only thing <laughs> my parents and family members know about Seattle is that we had, you know, a sex scandal and the mayor was involved in. So, um, so any anybody that can kind of bring back our reputation from that nationally um, would be. And that's what I was getting at. Yeah, would be a better would be a better spokesperson. Yeah, um, you know, an effective spokesperson for national change making based on a Seattle model. Yeah, and I agree. I think they're, I mean, I think Carrie would actually, um, you know, I could see her being a very good spokesperson as well. I mean, Jenny is sort of a no-brainer, like she's very polished, has a lot of experience. She was, you know, a, a very experienced attorney talking in front of people all the time. Um, but I think I think Carrie is also, just, just knowing her, uh, having seen her over the years, you know, I think she's very, as you said, are very articulate, very well spoken, and, um, you know, and I think would be, I mean, if, if she were somehow to win, I think she would be a more fun spokesperson for Seattle. I don't know if fun is something we want to go for, but, um, I don't you know. associate it with Jenny. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't associate it with Jenny either. Okay, so uh, most uh, of the media agrees that uh, housing affordability was probably the number one issue and will remain the number one issue in the campaign. But they don't seem to define it when they talk about it, neither the media nor the candidates. And my perception is that when Oliver and John Grant are talking about affordability, they're talking about rent, and um, particularly the lack of low-income housing and that sale housing levy is a small fraction of what's really needed to take care of the people who can't pay the rent. Rents too. John, when he first kicked off his campaign, you know, the rent's too damn high. He had the guy come in from New York, it was great. So there's, there's the rent's too damn high, and then there are people who, when they're saying the same words, are really talking about the lack of home ownership options for middle class millennials. <laughs> you know, like $700,000 townhouses are too expensive for me, and so we need to subdivide the lot. And then nobody is talking about the lack of middle class condos because of the condo liability law. There hadn't been any built since 2008. So <laughs> what, do, what is your uh, definition of avail affordability and how can we make that distinction clear? I mean, as somebody, I'm not a millennial, but I mean, I can't afford a 700,000, I can't afford anything in Seattle. Right, and, um, and so I think, you know, I think it would be, I think there's a, a missing discussion that needs to happen in, in our politics that, that you know, that ca the candidates don't talk about. I mean, you mentioned very low income housing. I think that's something that, you know, that does get talked about when we have a housing levy. Um, and I think property taxes get talked about to some extent for people who are already in home ownership housing. But I, but I agree with you, I mean, I think there's a whole middle area, you know, I pay, $1,400 a month in rent now, and that's pretty affordable in Seattle. Uh, I feel very lucky. Um, and um, there's, for people like me, you know, I mean, there's a whole missing middle where, you know, people are moving to Bellevue, mm -hmm. and um, and people, yeah. and Edmonds, and like, and I am of an age where, you know, in the trajectory of my life that I expected, I would own a house by now, or a, a condo, ideally. Um, and, you know, and you just have like, a whole huge swath of Seattle. I mean, the reason Seattle is majority renters, you know, or half renters, is um, is not because we love renting and we just think it's like a cool lifestyle that lets us be, you know, free and we could move at any time. It's because we can't buy a house. And we have to move at any time. And we have to move at any time. I mean, yeah, like it's. I mean, like I said, I feel very lucky because I have, you know, a really you know, decent living situation. But I mean, it's so unstable, and so I think. You know, I, I agree. I mean, I don't know what the answer is, but it would be great to see candidates talking about that huge, you know, middle half of people who, you know, want to buy places or being forced out of Seattle um, or just end up renting, you know, for their whole lives like I have. Um, yeah, house, housing happens to be one of the areas where I'm kind of a nerd. And 
you know, 80 to 100 percent of average median income. And it's actually a little lower than that now because average median income for households in Seattle has grown so dramatically. It went from 70,000 to 80,000 per household in uh, you know basically a couple of years. Uh, but that gap, uh, 80 to 100 percent AMI, is uh, probably the single biggest part of the uh, the sort of uh, uh, what, uh, what's the five Quintile. Yes, that quintile. Uh, I was losing the word. Uh, it, it's the big. It's the quintile with the biggest problem right now in terms of affordable rents and lack of uh, housing stock. And but you know all of those areas are problems. The very low housing is desperately short of what is needed, and uh, that's probably talked about the most because that has the biggest impact on people's lives. It doesn't mean that you're trading down in terms of the type of place that you can live in. It means you don't have a place to live or that you have to move to North Dakota to find a place where you can live. Um, but all of those areas, up and down the spectrum, including people in fairly comfortable middle-class uh, houses, you know, single single um, uh, household houses, who can't afford the property taxes. I mean, we just saw massive property tax increase courtesy of the state legislature. All of those things, and the, uh, obviously the property tax valuation is rising rapidly too. All of those things are huge issues that the city needs to wrestle with, and it all needs to I guess I, you know, don't know if I've got much to add. It's that I totally agree with that. That it's um, that that's that that sort of middle ground of people aren't being, um, you know, it's not talked about a whole lot. You know, yeah, we talk about kind of the lower end of the spectrum, like you know, about affordable housing and, and subsidized housing and that sort of thing. But we don't talk about, you know, yeah, the, the people who, um, you know, uh, you know, things like you know, condos and kind of middle uh, mid range. Type of apartments. I guess I wanted to talk about something other than apartments. But yeah, the mid-range type housing and condos and that sort of thing. I, I do think that it's a it's a really important issue. It's um, um, I, I think it's not um, you know, and it's interesting because I I actually don't know why it isn't a bigger issue than it is. Since I do think that that's kind of almost like I mean, not no, I'm talking with majority of people, but it's like a big group of people who are very productive and engaged, and you know, yeah. To see it become more of an issue. We have about 20 minutes left. I think everybody will actually get to ask their question. So I do have my eyes on everybody here. So you, I think you all get to ask. Uh, this November, the largest land development in the history of King County will be decided by a couple hundred votes. And that's in the city of Black Diamond. And out near Black Diamond, the Durkin family is well known or having property interests. I've known the Durkin family for 30 years. They're extremely nice people. I like them. We play golf. I mean, they're just really decent people. They've been political opponents for years of mine. Throughout the suburbs, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of units of apartments that are being built or are already built that are empty. There is no other, there is no place in the world that is a popular place with a good economy that isn't talking about housing affordability. And when we in Seattle are talking about housing affordability with 4% money, this means that the affordable housing issue is going to change dramatically, perhaps along the lines that John is talking about. The concern that I have is, that, is this. Durkin will pivot and bring in neighborhood support from people who do not want to have neighborhood busting zoning. And this is an undercurrent of vote. And that vote will go to her as an establishment candidate because the progressive left has, has uh, created a situation where as long as you're okay on climate change, and as long as you're then, the neighborhood issues like you're raising, which is sewers, and Mike's raising, such as trees, and open space, and school capacity, and all those other things, design, and all those other things that have defined the neighborhood movement uh, is now affordable housing. And so the progressive uh, left has split the neighborhoods in two, and you're inheriting the wind, and you will not be able to elect progressive candidates unless, until the young and the progressives 
start talking about street tree canopies and sewer disasters and water capacity and open space and urban wildlife and designs that are attractive schools. and all those <laughs> other and schools and all those other things. As long as the topic is affordable housing and affordable housing alone, then you will inherit the political win. Comments on how the progressive left can recombine the traditional neighborhood movement with the wonderful energy that's coming from the progressive left. Um, I think that raises a number of interesting points. I think it probably would have been uh, more salient in 2009 when the environmental community was clearly motivated by climate change, it was clearly motivated by promoting density as a way of ameliorating climate change. I think to a lot of the progressive left, it has, I don't know if it's necessarily been split. I think, I think uh, uh, <coughs> density is not talked about as much because it's a fait accompli. It is the policy of the city. It's going to continue to be the policy of the city. The question at this point becomes what type of density, and that's where the affordability comes in. And you're right. Uh, you know, I saw an analysis, I think it was in the Seattle Times a couple months ago, where uh, Seattle was, I think, number nine in the world in terms of cost of living. And it was number five among US, five US cities in the top nine, eight or nine in the top 20. And it was all cities that have severe housing crisis. It was the New York and Boston and San Francisco and Miami and all the places people want to live. Um, so, uh, so it's not a problem that's unique to here. Um, and, and as long as it, I, I think affordability is going to trump its quality of life when people are still trying to decide whether they can stay in Seattle or not. And, you know, I mean, I would, Brian, I would reverse your question a little bit, which is um, how can the neighborhood movement, you know, sort of build alliances with the progressive left? Um, well, I think they're part of it. You think they're, the, right. So, so when you're talking about people who are talking, who are obsessed with affordability over other issues, um, and, and, you know, and I would somewhat put myself in this camp, but too, but I think that um, affordability ties in so closely with climate change and so closely with a lot of issues that you fix affordability, you do start to address a lot of those issues. But but I think, you know, like Josh said, when you're when you're worrying about, you know, paying the rent next month and you know, when you're living literally paycheck to paycheck, which is how, you know, a tremendous number of people in Seattle are living, um, sewers and, you know, and traditional, you know, quote unquote traditional neighborhood issues like livability, like trees, um, are just not gonna be the top of your priority list. And I think that the neighborhood movement needs to expand to explain to people, you know, why it's in their interest to support these issues and also to maybe embrace affordability a little more, even if, you know, a, a lot of people that are, you know, that are here maybe not at the point in their lives where they're living paycheck to paycheck anymore. You know, you gotta realize, I mean, that is most of Seattle or a, a very large chunk of Seattle. And um, and you know and those and those folks live in neighborhoods too and um, and I and I guess that, you know as as somebody who's rented here for almost twenty years, I am you know I, and as somebody who's very you know invested in the political life of the city, um, you know I am very put off when I hear people tell me as they do often that people who rent um, don't have any investment in their neighborhoods and I find that personally insulting um, and I and I also just think politically it's self defeating because um, you know if you're Telling half the city that they don't matter, they don't—they're not invested. I mean, you're—you lost them. You're, they're not going to care about your tree issue. They're not going to care about your sewer issue, even though it's, so it's their sewer issue and their tree issue too, um, because you know, because you—you just you can't tell half the city that they don't matter and they don't—they don't care about neighborhoods. Speak to <laughs> No, I just—I I think I would agree with that too. That was all that. It's um, you know, if uh, you know, if I can't, if if, so, if you're talking to somebody and they can't afford to live in. Your neighborhood, and it's like your, your tree issue, and your you know is just theoretical, right? I mean, it's like that's great if you get to you know keep your trees, but you know I don't you know you're making me move to some other city, or I can't live here at all. You know, I mean, it's like I think that it's um, a matter of um, yeah, just trying to be more inclusive about like who you know whose interests are you also looking at, and kind of look at you know affordability as like another way to you know get people invested in your neighborhood and to have people um, feel like, well, I am going to actually stay here. You know, sure, I rent, but I'm going to be renting, you know, I expect I've been rent here for 10 years and I want to you know, rent here for 10 years. And so I, I do have a stake in whether 
um, you know, what, how my park looks, and you know, and what kinds of trees are, are on my are on my block, and what the and what the traffic is like, and how many cars are parked in the neighborhoods. I mean, that's you know, I think that kind of you know, um, understanding that that's um, you know that you know uh, helping people afford to live here is you know kind of part of you know the kind of long term strategy of, of um, you know keeping Seattle. Uh, of, of all those other traditional labor conditions, and I, I think that that's something that, um, you know, that's kind of work on kind of the I want to worry about that yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, yeah. There's, a lot, there's a lot of renters in Seattle who have to move every year, or every year or two, yeah. and they don't want to move. They don't want to be moving every year. It's a pain, but it's expensive. But if your rent keeps going up by more than you can afford, you keep having to move. Mm -hmm. Or if you're, you're you know, the, the house that you're renting in is going to get torn down so a, a fourplex can be built on the same lot, you're going to have to move. Um, and so you fix the affordability issue that is the core reason a lot of these people have to move frequently, and you get people who are more invested in neighborhoods too. So I think it's, I think Erica and, and Vanessa are absolutely right. You fix the affordability issue, you promote people's ability to stay in neighborhoods long term. And uh, you'll get more buy-in from those folks on other issues that they were have to care about. I'm Jim Erickson. Uh, I'm an almost 20-year renter on First Hill. Uh, I live on a fixed income. Uh, I think I'm going to have to move in a year or two. My market rate rent is going up rapidly. But as long as I'm here, my two primary questions for you are on open space and public safety. Two questions. Please comment on the city attorney race. And second question. On election night, Carrie Moon was quoted as saying she looks forward to working with the Seattle People's Party, whatever the primary results. Do you expect the Seattle People's Party to work to elect Moon? Why or why not? <laughs> the first rule of partic uh, political commentary is that you're never ever supposed to say, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, I think that Moon would like to work with the People's Party, whether they choose to do or not, I have no idea. I, I don't know how viable the People's Party is going forward, whether it's a personal vehicle for Nikita Oliver's ambitions or whether it's more broad-based than that. I don't have a sense of that yet. Um, and I don't think that very many people do, uh, you know, because these, these types of parties start with the best of intentions and a lot of enthusiasm, and sometimes they take hold and keep growing, and sometimes, uh, you know, the, the person who galvanized it moves on and it peters out. Um, and I don't know whether that translates to support for Moon in the general election or what the People's Party does going forward. I just I don't have a sense of it. Uh, city attorney's race, um, that's an interesting one. We hadn't talked about it yet. Um, I think uh, Pete Holmes is going to get more of a challenge than he maybe first expected to. He has a very strong and very well-funded opponent. Um, I think he's, it's likeliest that he will be reelected. Who is his opponent? Scott, um, Lindsay. Scott, Scott Lindsay, who uh, formerly worked with, uh, with, Mayor, um, uh, with Mayor Murray in, in that office and is very well connected politically. Um, Christine Gregoire, son-in-law. Yes, and, and has, um, uh, you know, Holmes just came off a, a fairly significant victory in terms of the state Supreme Court uh, ruling that the sales tax on, uh, on gun and ammunition uh, was in fact constitutional. He's in, got another major lawsuit which won't be decided by November, actually three of them now, on the new uh, hires income tax. Um, but, um, you know, Lindsay's gonna have to make the case that, uh, that Holmes has not done a good job. It's gonna be very interesting to see how he does that. I think, yeah, I think that he has not made a good case on that particular point so far. I think he's got, Scott Lindsay, I think he's got um, some support from um, from sort of law and order um, oriented uh, folks in neighborhoods who feel that, you know, as this gentleman did, you know, that there's a problem that's being caused primarily by drug users and, you know, and that property crime is up, which it is in many neighborhoods. Um, 
but I think Scott's problem is, um, you know, he's 39 years old. He, um, uh, you know, Pete, Pete Holmes can be very condescending about that, you know, and say things like, you know, maybe he should go try being a lawyer for a little while. Um, but, but I think, you know, he's, he's really unproven, and, um, and I think that people don't, don't see a real, and, until, until, unless he can make a really compelling case that not only does he have the same views as the majority of people, but he can actually implement them. You know, I, I see Pete getting elected pretty easily because, um, yeah, because Scott Lindsay is a political unknown. He may be connected, but he has absolutely no experience in, you know, running for elected office or really, I mean, as, as Pete Holmes points out, being an attorney. Um, so to your earlier question about the, um, the uh, People's Party, I think, um, you know, whether they support uh, Carrie Moon is up to them, and I don't get a sense of like what, you know, she's definitely, if that's going to happen, she's definitely going to have to win their support because they were, um, you know, really, uh, you know, they were really behind their candidate, you know, Oliver. So, uh, you know, they'll have to, they'll have to, she'll have to kind of work for that. And it'll be very yeah. easy to see what they ask for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, so just to say, it'll be interesting to see what they ask for and kind of to see like what, you know, kind of what kind of, uh, yeah, like how she's willing to work with them. I would say that, you know, it is understandable that you did say that at the, um, uh, uh, at primary, although I don't know, was that I don't I don't remember what the context was of that. I mean, was that about uh, just the, the vote, the vote chasing, or was that in general like she wanted to? Yeah, this is more general. Yeah, that was like more general. Okay, so. Well, she knows Jamie Durkin's yeah. not gonna get him. Yeah. Hi, I'm I'm part of the Madison Miller. Uh, community. It would be a neighborhood group where um, we've uh, responded to the DEIS uh, around uh, the lot of misrepresentation of displacement and uh, lack of affordable housing being recited where that displacement would occur uh, and, a, and a number of issues like the Adis and Dadis, uh being a better alternative for the density we need. Um, but in the course of doing that, I mean, this goes back to the question about uh, um, people who are renting and their voice in this whole process. We really, uh, we have two kind of sections that are maybe divided by East John, and this group has been working really hard uh, going after the Hala team to um, identify the flaws and the, the uh, lack of mitigation for the impacts that they're talking about. And so the city listened to some of that and in one of their alternatives there are really quite a few modifications that, that seem to respond to what we were talking about. But the line below John, south of John, stays completely unchanged. And I, we did a survey and I worked that, that area uh, twice, I did two rounds and knocked on, there's, there's no real single family houses. All of them are multiple, all, multiple units. Uh, a lot of senior housing, a lot of, and I individually talked to people and explained what's going on and asked them to do the survey so we would have real significant in, input from renters and people said they would and then we still didn't get that feedback. So I, I take that to mean that people are, deter, are discouraged and feel that they, that they really don't have any say that this is all outside of their power, whereas people who are property owners feel somewhat of leverage because of the, um, the Use taxes. Use the mic, please. Use the mic. Oh, taxes, they pay. Um, so that is, it would be helpful to respond to that and, for, and also for candidates to um, be, to speak more uh, audibly about that. The other thing is the, um, going back to the People's Party, aside from who's gonna vote for who or who's gonna back what candidate, uh, as we saw in the national election, Bernie uh, pulled a lot of progressive or white progressive Democrats uh, out of establishment 
uh, Democratic Party. And I'm, it seems like there's a longing here for a, another party, an independent. And I'm wondering how much you see an independent uh, vote emerging in this coming election. Well, I mean, you know, it's been really interesting to me to see people running on uh, on parties in Seattle because we're a nonpartisan system, you know, officially and unofficially we've been a Democratic Party system for so long. Um, so, um, you know, I don't, I mean, I don't know what that means. Like, so I don't know if the fact that John Grant has said he's now a Democratic Socialist and the fact that Shama Sawant is um, a, a socialist alternative member and the fact that there's now this People's Party. You know, I, I don't know to what extent those are personality-based and to what extent, you know, John Grant is just being opportunistic. Um, and so, um, you know, so I, I think it's, I think, it's too soon for me to say, but I think there's definitely, I mean, if you just look at the way the city council has moved, especially, um, it's moved so far to, to the left um, since, you know, since I've been here. And they're not, I mean, they're by no means radical, um, just as a body. I mean, they're still pretty much progressive Democrats, but, um, but the shift in terms of what is possible at the city council has been amazing to watch. I mean, whether you agree with it or not, I mean, what's possible has moved a lot, and now we're, you know, we're getting, you know, this um, legislation to um, make it easier for people with criminal histories to rent instead of, um, you know, potentially becoming homeless. I mean, that is going to pass, you know, overwhelmingly, or did pass, I can't remember. Um, and that, I mean, it's just so far beyond what would have happened, you know, 15 years ago, I think. So I think even if you're not going to see specific parties and affiliations, um, you're definitely, I mean, there's definitely been a big shift already. Yeah, and a lot of that specifically has happened in the last four years since the one first came on council. Um, and, you know, there's, especially with the demographic shift in Seattle, the, the, the pendulums probably, probably do swing back pretty soon. I do think that the, uh, the emergence of, you know, People's Party and Socialist Alternative and what Grant is saying, really, and, and the popularity that those things have, especially among young progressives, uh, really is because there's a sense that Democrats have been running Seattle since forever. It's been a one-party town, perception politically, it's pretty accurate. Even though 20% of registered voters in Seattle um, uh, so, like, really support Republicans, uh, which is another electorate that feels chronically underrepresented in Seattle. Um, and I, I think there's a sense, especially among young people, especially on affordable issues, that the status quo has failed them, that they don't have the opportunity to lead the kind of lifestyle that they want to because they can't afford to live here, because they can't get the kind of jobs that they want in a lot of cases. You know, a number of other issues like that where they see that some people are doing very, very well but the, the gap between people who are doing very well and people who are struggling or living paycheck to paycheck has been increasing and they're looking for voices that can speak to some of those issues because they don't see them being spoken to effectively by mainstream Democrats. That's, that's what gave Bernie Sanders traction nationally and it's very much true in Seattle as well. I don't know whether any particular issue or rather a, a party or a organizing effort is gonna get specific traction. I don't know whether the People's Party will or whether it's, uh, it's dependent on Oliver's personality. Uh, you know, uh, that came up as an alternative because I think a lot of people are uncomfortable with socialist alternative as a mainstream party. Um, but I do think that the hunger for something that is not uh, mainstream, you know, socially liberal, business friendly, democratic party business as usual, uh, a hunger for some alternative to that, some organized opposition to some of those policies is, is very real and it's going to continue to be real. Yeah, and I, I would, you know, I agree with that, but I, I guess I'm, so I'm in sort of kind of doing that a little bit because I'm trying to remember, we wasn't there like 20 years ago, there were three parties? Wasn't it? Uh, yeah, not officially. Yeah, not officially, yeah, right. but it's like, okay. you know, because we are, you know, do have a nonpartisan system, but yeah, but, but, there's a lot but of- But none of those yeah. got power. They, they appealed to Green Party people, they were endorsed by the Green Party, but they didn't really identify as Green Party. No, you, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, yeah uh, you had uh, at one point, 
Uh, I think it was three members of city council, Nick Licata, Peter Steinbrook, Richard Conlon, I'm showing my age here, who uh, got elected claiming Green Party support. Now, none of those three uh, were known as Green Party members. None of them were active in Green Party politics the way, say, Oliver is for the People's Party. They were all Democrats. Um, and the Green Party itself kind of withered and fell away after a few years in terms of being an effective uh, uh, party in Seattle politics. Um, but, um, but yeah, there's, there's been a demand there, but I think it's much stronger now, and I think the issues are much clearly defined by this time. And I would say that, you know, because, you know, we're essentially kind of a one, at least, you know, on the governing level, it's kind of like, you know, one party is sort of like dominating that, you know, there is kind of a desire for somebody to be the, uh, the opposition and to have like, you know, a, a, a voice that's outside of your, your regime or um, party system. So, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, I, I do, I, I, but I do think that, um, you know, having the People's Party kind of indicates that this is, you know, it's more about, or they're trying to build you know, other candidates to run for like city council and things like that. You know, to, you know, it's more comprehensive than just a personality driven, you know, a, or a personality driven party. You know, which is like you know that they support the key Oliver and nobody else. I think that they're going to see kind of in the next, or at least I think that that's that's the talk. Let's see if it, yeah. if it actually happens. Right. We have time for about one or two more questions. It's already eleven thirty, but I know people have been eager to ask. Mm -hmm. I would like to say, um, I haven't been involved in the neighborhood groups for a long time, but I do appreciate your perspective on how they've been shut out for the last decade. And I definitely think that it's time for us to dig ourselves out of that hole. I do appreciate your perspective on how we can change things. Where I'm from, I see a lot of uh, homes living paycheck to paycheck, although it's soon, it's social security check to social security check. So we do have insecurity issues as far as keeping our homes also. I do, I have had contact with some renters and I do know that they want a sense of community in the neighborhood and I think that's important. Um, my question is, how can we get renters, because until this forum, I thought renters and, were against homeowners and vice versa. How can we get renters to um, go along with us homeowners and see that we have the same issues in terms of affordability, in terms of staying in our places, in terms of preserving our communities and our neighborhoods, and preserving our institutions in our neighborhood, how can we get uh, renters to see that that's important also? I, I feel like it starts at a really grassroots level, um, which is, um, you know, uh, my neighborhood is, is pretty mixed, renter, homeowner, and, um, you know, and we meet each other in places like the Pea Patch. Um, you know, I, I say, you know, just in, in my sort of social community, you know, about half the people are homeowners, about half the renters, you know, it's pretty similar to Seattle. Um, and so, I, you know, I mean, this is, this is maybe not answering the larger question, but it's answering the smaller question, I think, which is like, I, you know, have night outs, invite your neighbors, get to know each other. I think that's the most important thing um, because, you know, it's really easy when you're a renter, especially in a really dense neighborhood like Capitol Hill or, you know, just a lot of the neighborhood, like your neighborhood, Miller, Miller Park, you know, where everybody kind of lives in buildings, it's really easy if you live in a building to never meet your neighbors. And, uh, and I think people really want that community. I mean, I lived in a building for a while um, on Capitol Hill, and I knew, you know, maybe two of my neighbors in a building of, you know, 60 people. Um, and, you know, I, and, and nobody likes that, but it just kind of happened. So I think as renter, you know, I don't always feel, I have not always felt included um, in my neighborhood. And the neighborhood I live in now, I really do. Because, you know, we have an alley party on night out. and. You know, and everybody knows each other in the pea patch, and we all get together and like help beautify the neighborhood. So I, I, I mean, that sounds like kind of a cheesy pop out, maybe, but um, but I find that stuff really important. And I think if you can't relate on that one-on-one -on -one level, you know, it's going to be really hard to argue about policy. 